Hey everyone, welcome to AP Psychology. Uh, this is going to be your first lecture of the year, and I just want to welcome you kind of through this screen of uh, what this class is going to look like, at least in regard to lectures and taking notes and things like that. Uh, we're going to try to flip this classroom where most of the lectures you're going to hear this year will be recorded lectures. And there's a lot of really great benefit to that. Um, the benefit being, you have it with you all the time. So if you're in class and you're trying to listen to a lecture, you might miss something or you might be kind of tired or, or maybe you're absent. And so it's difficult to make sure you get that material. Well, with a recorded lecture that you can listen to on your own time, you know, this gives you the benefit of always having it available. So there are a couple of things I want to remind you before we get started. And one is I want you to try to, to treat this like you would if you were in class. If you were sitting in class and I was giving a lecture to you, the expectation would be that you are engaged, that you have a notebook out, that you're taking notes, um, and that you're participating. Well, some of that might seem a little weird with a recorded lecture, but this is what I mean. What I mean is when you're listening to lectures in this class, I want to make sure that you're engaged, meaning you don't have your, you know, your TV on, you don't have your phone out and you're playing video games or something, but you're actually paying attention and engaged with the lecture. If you're getting tired or if you're getting bored, take a break. That's one of the beauties of having a recorded lecture. The second part is note taking. Uh, it's very important that when you're listening to these lectures, have a notebook in front of you, have a pen, and make sure you're getting down the content that I'm talking about. We are going to go over a ton of information this year, and if you simply try to press play, listen to a video, let your brain absorb it, and then think that that's going to be enough to be successful in this class, it's not. You're going to have to write things down. And so I go pretty fast. The benefit is you can pause, you can rewind, and make sure you get those notes. And I will be checking notes uh, in class when I see you just to make sure that this isn't a completely passive experience, that you're not just pressing play and walking away, but you're actually getting something tangible out of it. And then lastly, that aspect of participation. That's kind of a weird thing to do with this kind of one-way lecture that we're experiencing through a computer screen. By participation, what I mean is while you're listening, write questions down. Maybe I say something that doesn't make a lot of sense or you want another example. Write those questions down. Maybe you can write them in a different color pen. Maybe you can put it on a post-it note. Um, and then when the lecture is over, you have some options. You can either email me if you, if you want to know that answer right away. Hey, in that lecture, what did you mean by this? Or bring those questions to class if that's possible. And when we're in class and we're talking about something, maybe we're doing a simulation, you can say, hey, in your lecture, you brought this up. I'm not quite sure what that meant, right? So make sure that you have the opportunity to ask questions just like you would if we were having a lecture face to face. So let's get started. Psychology, History, and Perspectives. I love this quote by Herman Ebbinghaus. Uh, he's a guy who studied memory. We'll talk more about him later this year. But this quote, psychology has a long history but a short past. I think that's going to make some sense when you hear the rest of this lecture. The things that we talk about in psychology, people have been talking about for literally thousands of years. But psychology as a discipline, like literally the name psychology and what they are uh, talking about in textbooks and, and, you know, people taking psychology classes in school, that's a relatively short time period uh, compared to lots of other disciplines that, uh, that you take at Park Hill. This is going to be uh, one of those, those courses or those disciplines that uh, there isn't, uh, you know, centuries and centuries and centuries of material, um, it's relatively short, and, and we'll get there. But let's start uh, at the roots where we need to, and that is, what is psychology? Like, what is this class going to be about? Well, psychology, as you can see there, the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. And I want to emphasize these two words, scientific study. Uh, psychology is a science. It's a soft science. It's not a hard science like chemistry. You know, in chemistry, if you take element A and element B and you put them in a beaker and you shake it up, you're going to get some result. And if you do it again and you have the same quantities, at the same temperature, you're going to likely get the same result. Psychology is not always like that. Element A might be a loaf of bread. Element B might be an empty classroom. And uh, I file a bunch of students in there, lock the door, 
and then see what happens, right? And maybe everyone is very peaceful and they divide up the bread, or maybe someone becomes really angry and they try to hoard the bread from everyone else. Psychology is a soft science in the sense that we can study what's happened. We can understand or try to understand human behavior and make predictions for the future. But there's always that human element, right? There's always this other variable that might come into play. So as we talk about psychology this year, remind yourself it's a scientific study. And when we talk about different concepts and terms, we're talking about things that have been put to the test. Uh, we may accidentally fall into this idea that all of psychology is common sense. Well, that's not necessarily the case, right? When we're talking about concepts, we have put them to the test and uh, we'll try to demonstrate that uh, early in the year so that you can get yourself in the right mindset. And then the last part of this definition, behavior and mental processes, uh, what are we doing? What are we feeling? What are we thinking about? And that's gonna be a big theme throughout the year. So let's rewind the clock. We're talking a couple thousand years ago in Greece, right? Well, psychology takes its roots actually in philosophy. And so we have these philosophical questions that we attempt to answer using the same methods of, of a natural science. And I have some examples there. Don't, don't feel like you need to write those examples necessarily in your notes, but I just want you to kind of think about this for a moment, right? Uh, is our behavior the result of nature or nurture? Am, am I the way that I am right now because of my genetics, right? Because of something internal, something biological? Or am I the way that I am because of how I was raised and parenting styles and the neighborhood I grew up in and my education and things like that? That's a very philosophical question. Well, what psychologists try to do is they try to think about these philosophical questions and they try to answer them but they answer them using science. And spoiler alert, our behavior is really kind of a mixture of the two, right? So we have these big players in the, the early days of psychology or philosophy, and those are likely some familiar names, perhaps from a world history class that you've had. Uh, I have them organized in uh, kind of a certain way. So Socrates and Plato, for example, in world history, you need to be able to differentiate Socrates and Plato. For AP psychology, you won't, right? You won't need to. Now, Plato was, was Socrates' student, but you're not going to need to differentiate these two guys for this class. Instead, what I want you to do is kind of put them in the same club or the same camp. And Socrates and Plato were, were trying to um, theorize about different aspects of who we are and our mind. For example, Socrates and Plato believed that the body and the mind were separate. If one ceased to exist, the other continued on. Kind of an interesting thing to think about. They also believed that our ideas and our knowledge was innate. In other words, it was something that we were born with. And Aristotle, who, who came after Plato, he challenged these ideas. Aristotle said, you know, I, I think that our body and our mind are really one. They're one and the same. And that our mind is created through experience and that it takes time to build ideas. It's not something that we're just born with. So you can see, you can almost draw a line that separates these two camps. And these ideas, they, they, they kind of rested for centuries until the 1600s and they were revitalized by this, by this guy in France named Rene Descartes. And Rene Descartes started looking at these really old philosophical questions. And, and we will put Descartes kind of in the same group as Socrates and Plato. And so you can think like these three guys kind of go together for the sake of AP psychology, right? And so Descartes, again, believes like, yeah, the mind and body are separate. And, and Descartes did some interesting things. Like, for example, he, through dissection, he found veins and believed that our, our mind communicated with our body by sending animal spirits through our veins. Well, that seems a little wild and crazy today, but some of it was kind of true in the sense that we have veins and veins carry blood, but we also have nerves and nerves do send messages from our mind telling our body what to do. So he wasn't that far off given the technology that he had in the 1600s, right? And then across the English Channel, we've got, uh, we've got this guy named Francis Bacon and John Locke, and we're going to put those guys in the same camp as Aristotle, 
the reason we're going to put them in Aristotle's camp is because guys like Francis Bacon and John Locke, they are going to agree with ideas like our mind and body are one and the same. Francis Bacon is going to establish what we now know as the scientific method. So when you're in science class and you're learning about, you know, coming up with a hypothesis and testing and retesting, publishing your results, all that wonderful stuff, you can thank Francis Bacon for what we think of in regard to the scientific method. And then John Locke, John Locke is going to say that our mind when we are born is blank, that we will build uh, our knowledge and our ideas on experience. And so this is really interesting. This is important as we get into our next slide. Knowledge is the result of experience. So if that's the case, right, then we need to recognize if we want to know what is true, we need to put it to the test. And that leads us to this idea called empiricism. So think about that. If knowledge comes from experience, right, science, knowledge, should rely on experience. It should rely on observation and experimentation. And so Francis Bacon is like the father of what we, what we call empiricism. If you see that word empiricism or something is empirical, we're saying, where's the science? Where's the observation? Where can we pinpoint that this is truth? It's not just some philosophical idea, but there is empirical data. There is empirical evidence of where did we gain this knowledge? So I want to introduce you to this uh, handsome man sitting down with the beard. His name uh, was Wilhelm Wundt. And some of you might say William Wundt, but it's Wilhelm Wundt, and he was a German. And we're talking 1879. And he did something that's really fascinating. So we had people sit down and there was a little button in front of them and a metal plate and Wundt would drop a marble and when the marble hit the metal plate, it would start a timer. And he told the participants, when you hear the, the marble hit the plate, push the button, but he probably did it in like a cool German accent, right? And so the, the marble hits the metal plate, it starts a timer, the participant pushes a button which stops the timer. It's a reaction test. Pretty simple. Drop the marble, push the button. Drop the marble, push the button. But then he slightly changed it. He told the participants, I'm going to drop this marble on the plate. And when you are consciously aware, when you recognize, yes, that was the marble that hit the plate, then I want you to push the button. Seems like the same task. But what he found was it took participants just a little bit longer to push the button. It took them just a little bit longer to consciously think, Yep, that was the marble that hit the plate. Time to push the button. And that fraction of a difference between the first trial and the second trial, I mean, we're talking fractions of a second. Wundt says that was a thought, which is fascinating. He was the first person to quantify, to put a number on a thought process. And he made the task more complicated. You know, I'm going to drop a marble. It's going to hit a plate. It's going to turn on a light. If the light is green, you're going to pull a lever. If the light is red, you're going to push a button. And sure enough, as the task became more complicated, as you had to think about it more, the reaction time slowed. And he can measure those. And so he's saying he's measuring the atoms of the mind. Well, there's no atoms of the mind, right? But that's what he's claiming. He's measuring the atoms of the mind. And he's credited as being the founder of psychology. Right? He's the founder of psychology. Uh, this was the first scientific psycholo psychological experiment, the first psych lab known to exist. And so we've got a little saying, without Wundt, there wouldn't be psychology. And if you were in class, you would all be just dying with laughter right now. Right. So the last slide for this uh, particular lecture is going to say, well, then where did it go? Right. So we now, it's 1879, psychology is born because of Wundt. What happens? What do we do with it? Well, now there is this scramble of like trying to create an idea of, well, what do we do with psychology? And one of Wundt's students, his name was Edward Titchener. Well, he created this school of structuralism. It's not an actual school. It's not like a, you know, brick and mortar building. When I say a school of structuralists, I'm meaning it's a group of people that all believe the same thing. And Titchener believes that the purpose of psychology is to figure out what the mind does. So I could have you, for example, think about all the different things that our mind does. Well, 
our mind allows us to experience emotions. Our mind allows us to have memory of the past. Our mind allows us to problem solve, right? These are all the different things that the mind does. And that's what Titchener was trying to figure out. He studied this through a concept called introspection. Introspection, the word kind of defines what it looks like. It's when we are looking inward. So he'd have people, for example, uh, we're looking inward to better understand ourselves, right? So he'd have someone smell a rose and he'd have them describe what is going on in their mind when they smell a rose. Maybe it's a certain sensation. Maybe it's a memory of the past, right? The problem with introspection was he could have, he could have two people smell the same rose, but describe what's happening in their mind differently. In fact, he could have the same person smell a rose on two separate days and they describe what's happening in their mind differently. So structuralists, they didn't last very long because it wasn't very reliable. Introspection wasn't very reliable. So bring along their next school of thought. And it was started by this guy named William James. He taught at a place called Harvard. And William James started the school of uh, functionalism. He shifts the idea from what does our mind do to why does our mind do it? Yes, our mind can experience sensations. Yes, our mind can experience memories. It can think critically. But why are those things important? Why is it important that I have memory that that tiger could kill me, right? And so William James is credited as being the first American psychologist. Wundt, first psychologist. William James, first American psychologist. And he starts the school of functionalism. What is the... the purpose of our mind. That's the idea of functionalism. What's the, the purpose? What is the function of our mind? And so there's kind of this analogy, right? And I want you to listen to these two questions. A structuralist would ask, what do the brakes on a car do? Right? Well, they help a car stop. A functionalist would ask, why is it important that cars have brakes? See how that's a different question? Right? So that's kind of the difference between structuralists and functionalists. Uh, and then I have in there Mary Witten Calkins. So Mary Witten Calkins, really interesting story. Uh, this is 18, 1890s, and um, she walks into a classroom in Harvard, sits down in William James' class to take a psychology class. And all the other men kind of look around, and they're all, what's this woman doing in our psych class? Well, William James makes a decision right then and there that says, if you don't want to be in this room with, uh, with this woman, then you are free to leave. Well, all these men stood up and left, and William James taught just Mary Witten Calkins one-on-one, -on -one, and she is credited as being the first female psychologist. So in this lecture, we got the first psychologist, that's Wilhelm Wundt, the first American psychologist, that's William James, and the first female psychologist, that's Mary Witten Calkins. She would actually go on to become president of the American Psychological Association in 1905. So lots of interesting people that we're talking about. Structuralists and functionalists, the two schools of thought, what's the purpose of psychology? We're going to wrap up this video now. Give yourself a break. Our next video is going to talk about kind of part two of the history. So where are we going now that psychology is starting to dig its roots into the world? If you have any questions at all, please let me know. And uh, good luck, everyone.